Welcome to today's episode of the Selling the Cloud podcast. I'm your co-host, Ray Wright, and I'm joined by my co-host, Mark Petruzzi. Hey, Mark. Hey, Ray. So today we are joined by Andy Paul, the host of the Sales Enablement podcast and the recent author of a book that was just published, Sell Without Selling Out. Today, we'll be covering three topics with Andy and Mark. First, selling to humans, what the buyer really needs from you. Second, the one question every buyer will ask every seller. And third, the power of curiosity and the power of generosity. Andy, please take a moment to give a brief background of your journey to becoming a guest on the Selling the Cloud podcast. (laughs) Thank you, Ray. Uh, And Mark, thank you for having me here. Gosh, been in sales forever. Let's start there. And uh, worked for startups for a number of years, started my own company in the year 2000 with the express intent of teaching small companies, uh, primarily startups, but small companies, how to go out and win big deals. Because that, <clears throat> excuse me, because that's what I'd done for the startups I'd worked on. We were selling large mission critical communications networks <laughs> as a small company selling seven, eight, nine figure deals to <laughs> big, big companies around the world. How do we compete against the big guys? So that's sort of my specialty to start my company with. And then gosh, about year 2000, 11, 2012, published my first book, and it sort of led me down this path today as an author, a speaker, and a, a podcaster, and still do a fair amount of coaching and consulting as well. We're excited to have you here today, and mostly because your most recent book, Sell Without Selling Out, was just published, I believe, on the 22nd, Andy, is that right? Yeah, the day day before we recorded this, yes. Well, we're a day late in recording it, but what well, was okay. the motivation? What was the motivation behind writing this latest book? Well, the, the basic motivation was that in my perspective and based on my experience and gosh, all the people I deal with in, in my profession is sales wasn't getting any better. That we seem to have been stuck in a rut with sort of the same set of sales behaviors driving sellers that had been practiced for, for decades. And and part was triggered by this idea that that so many people try to put forward is, especially in the tech world, is that, hey, we are practicing modern sales. And really what you're practicing is the same old stuff. You've just automated it. And the results really show that we're not getting any better. In fact, you could make the case, arguably, that as sellers, we're becoming less productive and performing at lower levels than we have in the past, despite all the advantages of technology. And so as I was really analyzing that and looking at that, it's like, okay, well, why is that the case? And fundamentally, it's because, yeah, we haven't changed with the times and we're not helping the buyers make decisions the way they want to. So, Andy, that's that's very insightful. And what's really interesting to me is I believe you have done over 1000 podcasts in your career. And, you know, that's uh, that's a feat in itself. Um, But over that time frame, let's talk a little bit before we go deeper into how we feel we should change selling. Mm -hmm. How how has the market changed? How has buyers changed? Maybe what are the top two or three major differences today versus when you started doing your podcast work a number of years ago? I don't know if there's any real like night and day differences, I think there's just a continuation of trends, right? That were starting back then or had been started prior to that, but have become accentuated over that time is, is one is, you know, self-service for the buyer, right? Is there's greater ability on the part of the buyers to, to accomplish more of their buying process on their own without the aid of salespeople. And we can get into discussion later as whether they really want to do that or not, or under what circumstances they want to do that. But that's certainly one one trend. And one trend, obviously, that you know goes along with that is just the fact that the information asymmetry that used to exist between sellers and buyers, meaning you know, when I got started selling, there wasn't the internet. So I held all the cards relative to information about my product, except for if you want to go buy a subscription to McGraw Hill Data Pro. I don't think either of your brothers remember Data Pro and the big binders of, of uh, brochureware that was in there. So that's that's obviously one thing that's changed as well. And so, yeah, and those started before, but it's becoming more pronounced. And and my concern, and part of the reason, again, I was writing the book was that if we don't change, then the logical conclusion is that the buyers will continue to find ways to completely do their job without the, the need for salespeople. And that's not a situation I think they necessarily want to be in for, for a variety of reasons. But if we don't 
get our act together, that's what's going to happen. You know, what's interesting about that, Andy, you know, every time we talk, I got to throw some metrics and benchmarks out, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I was reading some research, which wasn't ours, that I think 54% of B2B buyers who bought in a non-human assisted form regretted their purchase. Over mm-hmm. 50%, 54%. So I don't think buyers really want to go through the entire considered purchase process without speaking to a human, i.e. a salesperson to help them through that journey. Do you agree with that? Yeah, well, I think, yes, basically. I think there's sort of two motivations for there. One is, you know, with every purchase decision, there's an element of risk associated with it, right? So how do we mitigate our risks? Well, we we gather information from more sources, right? As you know, we have somebody help, like a salesperson, help uh, validate the decision we're making to some degree. But the other one is that that I think, and I think some of this is sort of a little unconscious, but I think you, some organizations are sensitive to this. Is this idea that you know, there's been a lot of research about weak ties and strong ties among people, and so with people you work with on a day to day basis, you develop these strong ties. And what happens is that you sort of continue to re-socialize the same information. So you all know the same things. So when you're trying to accomplish the job of, let's say, making a purchase decision to make a substantive change in your business, if you're not bringing in people that you have weak ties with, who bring new information to the party, then you run the greater risk of, of making a decision that's going to be less effective. And so you need to integrate you know, other sources of information that isn't redundant or aren't redundant to what you know internally. And so this idea that, yeah, they need buyers, need sellers to help them think more deeply and broadly about the challenges they face and the potential outcomes they can achieve. And the self-aware buyers know that. And so, yes, to your point, would they regret? Yeah, I think there's a high level of regret. And I think this, this mythology that's being put forth <clears throat> by certain analysts saying, look, buyers don't want to talk to sellers. Well, Hey, from my perspective, having been in sales for decades, buyers never wanted to talk to me, quite frankly, right? They don't wake up saying, yeah, gee, I wish Andy calls me, right? Or the worst the salesperson calls me. But they have time for you if you can help them get their job done. That's the bottom line. Yeah, if you can help the buyer get their job done, do a better job of it, make a better decision, then they have time for you. If you can't help them with that, they're not going to give you time. You know, it's pretty clear cut. They want to talk to you if you can help them. So Andy, I um, I've enjoyed your entire book. But I especially well, thank you. enjoyed. You're welcome. I especially enjoyed the chapter um, selling to humans, and uh, and I love it just from the title because it seems like salespeople forget every once in a while that they are selling to humans, right? <laughs> we we try to do methodologies and process, and you know what? We'd be better off selling the robots because. If sure. you do the same things over and over again with a robot, you're probably going to invoke the same response. Um, although with AI, that can change as well. But um, so tell us more about the title, the, the chapter, and why it's so important for sales reps to remember that they're selling and interacting with humans when they sell. Yeah. I mean, how much time do we have? <laughs> so. <laughs> Yeah, as I say in that chapter, you know, it's <laughs> unfortunately our job is to sell to humans, but unfortunately we're not very good at it. And yeah, I think a lot of that's driven by by process and driven by methodology that that's forcing sellers increasingly to be more uh, programmatic and mechanical in how they sell. And if you're mechanical, if you're robotic in how you sell to the buyer, they're, they're going to be robotic in return. I, yeah, I give the examples. You know, if you ask buyers or the scripted list of questions, you're going to get a scripted list of answers, right? Because the, you train them, you meaning sellers in general, we train them. We're going to come in and do the sort of drive-by interrogation with sort of the set list of questions that either have been given to us in our playbook or that we've you know developed their own experience, but it doesn't go deep enough to help the buyer, right? Because again, our job as sellers, as I talk about in the book, it's not to persuade the buyer to buy our product. It's to listen to them, to understand what are the most important things to them, meaning what are the biggest challenges they have and what are the most important outcomes they want to achieve for making this investment and then help them get that. And you know, the first one is if you're just saying my job is to go out and persuade somebody to buy my product, then it's sort of a zero sum game, right? To some degree. I've 
you've got a problem. The solution must be my product. And that's just not the way the world works and not the way that, that uh, humans work. So what buyers need from you is to come in. Yeah. Dig deeper than what you normally dig. You have a whole chapter on curiosity, <laughs> but is, is to go beyond just gathering information, right? The way discovery is conducted in too many instances is it's like a survey, right? I've got a list of questions or a check off that we got the answers. So I know a certain amount about you, but I don't understand anything, right? I don't understand what's most important to you. I don't understand who it's most important to within your organization. I don't understand that. So I'm ending up being in the position of so many sellers to get into is they sell before they understand. And if that's the case, what are you aiming at? What's the target? If you don't understand, what are you aiming at? Well, I'm aiming at getting an order for my product. Well, how's that relate to what the buyer wants? Andy, let's pivot that just a little bit to not the selling process, but that first engagement process. Mm -hmm. I mean, sales technology is everywhere. And one of the largest adopted sales techs is sales engagement platforms to automate that initial outreach with 10, 12, 14 touches over a 30-day period. Mm. So here's a question for you about selling to humans. I've always said doing a lot of research and tailoring the email based upon what I think the company needs or how we can help them or what I think that person, how we can value them, is much more effective as measured by conversion to an actual conversation and a discovery call. Mm. Do you agree with that? Do you think we've placed quantity and automation over personalization when it comes to initial engagement? Well, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> the 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 is problem the, 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 the problem is not the tools. The problem is how they're used, right? This is an argument I get into with uh, you know people you and I both know. Is is it's yeah the our, the problem is not the technology. It's how it's being used. So and this is sort of a conundrum that sort of exists in the tech world in general. And I you know I've grown up in this world. This is has been my life, but. Yeah, the, the lesson that just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do something is a lesson that seems to escape most people. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I've written in the past, you know, I think one of the craziest sentences, you know, ever that I've seen in marketing is materials about sales engagement is, you know, mass personalization at scale. <laughs> it's like, okay, how many, how many oxymorons can we put into one sentence? Yeah, let's so, be yeah. honest, mass, mass personalization equals insert first name here, insert company name here, right? That's right. that. Yeah, it's just part and parcel of, I think, one of the things that's that's problematic about the way that, that sales is conducted, us as more specifically in the tech world these days, is that they've become so reliant on, on the way they use this technology to fill the top of the funnel that it has an impact on how they conduct sales through the funnel, right? Because if we say, look, we're just going to put a bunch of crap into the top of the funnel, even if we're not very good at selling, we're going to close a certain percentage, right? And, and win rates in general in the SaaS world are pretty low, right? As an organization, it'd be 20%, 24%, 25%. It's like, well, huh. So your, your best sellers, theoretically, or your average sellers are selling, they're only able to win one out of every four of your most qualified opportunities. What's wrong with that picture? Well, what's wrong with that picture is the buyer saying, you didn't give me any reason to buy from you. And this is, and yet this is considered acceptable because we make do for the fact that we have gotten really good using the tools the way you described to sort of fill the top of the funnel. At some point, there's got to be a reckoning to say, look, if we're not able to win a majority of our opportunities, maybe we really don't have product market fit. Wow, that's, that's very interesting, especially when you look at all the money and time and effort that's expended to deal with that huge funnel. Mm -hmm. So shifting gears a little bit, too, is one significant point that you highlighted in the book is this concept of the question of what every buyer will ask you. <laughs> yes. So what will every buyer ask you, Andy? Well, can I tell the story from the book? So, yeah. yeah, I mean, this came about because early in my career, I was selling computer systems uh, for accounting systems to the construction industry. And I was in the San Francisco Bay Area. And I was calling on this large home builder, one of the largest home builders in the Bay Area. 
And I was calling on the CEO, had no expectation at all that he would <laughs> he would be available for me. But I walked in, went, said to the receptionist at the inn, and to my shock and surprise, she said, yes, yeah, he'll, he'll be right out. And so he comes out and he takes me into his office and he, he has this huge desk that's completely clean. And yeah, you know, I start pitching and he holds his hand up, tells me to stop. He reaches into his desk drawer and pulls out this two inch high deck of business cards wrapped by a rubber band. He undoes the rubber band, spreads the cards out like a play, deck of playing cards. And he says, so these are all the computer salespeople that have called on me in the last year. And I haven't bought from any of them. So, Mr. Paul, Mr. Paul, why should I buy from you? And I, it dawned on me at that moment, he wasn't talking about why he should buy from my company. He was talking about why should he buy from me? This was a huge eye-opening moment, right? Because it had never really dawned on me before. So as I started thinking about that, he was really asking this question, was, why me? What is it about me? Why should he buy from me? And answer that question at that time is I had no idea. <laughs> I was completely <laughs> clueless, but, but he sort of mentored me over the next year and, and I eventually got an order from him. But that's the lesson is, is that, you know, anytime you engage with somebody, they, they have a choice about how they're going to invest their time and how they're going to invest their attention. And so if, if people, I think, go through and, you know, daily life, we go through all these questions, we interact with other people, you know, why should I trust you? Why should I believe you? Why should I invest my time in you? I still go down the list of questions that start with the word why and end with the word you. And I have a list of those in the book. And just take all the middle words out. And what you're left is this question that everybody asks about everybody else when you engage with them is why you? And this is certainly true in, in selling is when you're dealing with your buyers and prospects, they're like you. They've got a limited amount of time and a limited amount of attention that they can invest, why should they invest it in you? And this is not a question that you can answer verbally like, oh, you know, because I'm the greatest salesperson in the world. It's they're going to experience it, right? Based on the first impressions you create, you know, the, how engaging are you with the questions you ask? How interested are you in them? You know, these, these things that happen right up front, oftentimes, people are making judgments and decisions about you. You know, and to my mind, there's, there's, that's why I keep telling people, there's no such thing as an unimportant interaction with the buyer because you never know which one is the one that they're going to be judging you on. You know, in today's world of video games, I've gotten used to being able to get cheat codes. Sometimes <laughs> you pay for them, et cetera. So, right. Andy, do you have the cheat codes of what are the two or three things a great B2B salesperson can do to prove that? why you is answered. Are there certain recommendations you have on how I can sure. prove that? Sure. So first of all is, is create a positive first impression, right? Pay attention to detail, be on time, um, be polite. Don't presume familiarity. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I've written about before that, you know, just drives me nuts is don't call the 50 year old CEO of a company buddy or pal right? Happens all the time. I hate it. You know, if you're trying to sell to me, that's an instant disqualifier. You know, I'm not your buddy. I'm not your pal. Attention to detail matters. And so that's one way. It's just create a strong first impression. So that means you got to pay attention. You have to be intentional about doing that. You know, the next thing is just demonstrate an interest in someone else, right? The way you make yourself interesting to a buyer is to be interested in them. So I talk about in the book, this, this rule I call the ask five rule, which is, can you ask five questions of the buyer before you have to say anything about yourself? <laughs> and this is something you can practice in social situations, right? As you go to a wedding or you, you know, a social event of some sort, assuming we're all doing that these days. And yeah, demonstrate interest in somebody else. Practice this ability to hold the attention of somebody else by asking them questions and then not talking about yourself. And the thing is that motion is, should be familiar to everybody because that's how we make friends. And I know people yeah. hate to use the word sales with friends. We're not trying to make friends of our buyers, but it's the same basic motion you make, right? If you meet somebody in a social setting that you don't know, you might think, you know, you get, there's a little something there. You think, okay, well, gosh, could be a, you know, somebody, a friend, maybe it's the first thing you do. You ask them for something, right? And Randy, I tell them how great I am. 
Yeah. Well, you tell them how great you are. And then you said, you know, give me your details so I can put you into my friend funnel and you're going to get emails from me. But, you know, I'll try to get you to, to like me. No, you, you, you're curious about them because you want to make a decision as to whether they're worth more of your time and attention. Mm -hmm. Same thing your buyers are doing. So, Andy, you figured out why Ray and I are friends because I listen to him tell me how great he is. All oh, the there time. you go. So that's that's our friendship. But um, I'd like to double click on something here because we're, we're right in the, the fringes of an area that I truly believe in. We spend so much time as sales reps, particularly in technology, trying to go in and sell our product, our company. And guess what? If you really look around now, and there's some CEOs of some friends of mine who are CEOs of companies that are probably going to give me a little text on this to say, well, my product is, is, is better. But how many products in technology are that much significantly different or it's just that you need them over their two or three top competitors? There's not much. There's not so much, I love, no. Yeah, and I love the idea of, you know, this really, as a salesperson, this is about you. And yeah. you can spend your time coming in there and, and really taking care of your prospect mm -hmm. and giving them the data they need, but not trying to, I mean, I see people making stuff up, frankly, lying about their product to try to make it different or better. And guess what? They would have sold the deal without lying. Because yes. This person wanted to buy from that particular sales rep. So can you take us more into this concept of, you know, it, it is less about the product. It is more about you. And frankly, you just, you, you don't have to work so hard because most of this other stuff is easy to do. Like you said, easy to be a friend, easy to make a friend if you do the right things. Yeah. Well, I mean, as I write about in the book is, is the four pillars of selling in that I describe are all innate human behaviors, right? Is, is the things we're trying to get rid of the salesy behaviors that the buyers don't like, those are all learned behaviors, right? So we can dispense with those today and just be ourselves and be much better off. You really express the, the whole thing right there is that the differences between products are slight, right? And I think over time, especially one of the things is one of the things that has changed a lot in the last, let's say, 20 years is, you know, given a more, more software driven world is the ability to create sustained, meaningful product differentiation is extremely difficult, right? The barriers to entry from a technology standpoint are very low and the software world by and large Things get you know copied. I mean, look just look in the conversational intelligence space alone, which you know Revenue.io is in. Just in the last two years, there's probably been a doubling in the number of companies offering that type of product and service. Yeah. So, if that is, that is the case, it's not if that is the case. That is the case. So, on what basis are buyers making their decision? It's based on their buying experience with the seller. That's what it boils down to. How is the buyer experiencing going through their buying journey with you? individually, or maybe you as, you know, plus your colleagues that are helping, but that's what they're making their decision on. Yeah. Andy, in the book, I think it was chapter 10, one of those human selling elements is curiosity, right? Yes. You ask questions, not just, because, not just because it's in your script, you ask questions because you really want to understand. Right. But you had four keys to unlocking this kind of human trait of curiosity. One of them was, you know, curiosity is as important as intelligence. And I'm like, yes. that's really interesting because it's not the way we become smarter is by asking well, questions. Absolutely. Sure. Well, and this is curiosity is how we navigate the world, right? You know, when we come out when we're born or we're growing up and the world around us is unfamiliar, how do we, how do we navigate it? How do we learn about the world? It's through our curiosity. We're not sitting there waiting for somebody to, to tell us everything is, is we go out and explore and we learn. So there's been some research on this and it's been written up like in Harvard Business Review and so on is this idea of, you know, we've got IQ, EQ, and then CQ. So your curiosity quotient. And there's uh -huh. been some, some studies showing that, you know, that correlates more to success than either IQ or EQ does. Well, the other thing you said, it was the fourth key, I believe, is curiosity requires persistence. And as a very yeah. persistent person, I'm like, ah, I like it. But sometimes persistence can be annoying. So can you tell me a little bit more about that plot? Well, it depends how you do it, right? 
I said before, I started my career selling computer systems, you know, room fulls of iron to construction companies. And I started, you know, I was 21 and I knew nothing, right? Knew nothing about business. I knew a little bit about accounting. I knew nothing about the construction industry. And in my first year, I made President's Club. Well, how did I do that? Well, Legion of Honor, they called it at Burroughs. But it's because I was sincere when I met with these CEOs and these, these entrepreneurs that founded these companies. I was sincere in my interest in learning. And they never said, go away. You're asking too many questions. And for me, that was such a great lesson. It's like, oh, yeah. I mean, as long as I'm really interested, as long as I'm reasonably well-informed, and then I'll get the time and attention of people because they know I'm there to try to help them. And, and I think that's, that's really the, the key, right? Is, is I've never been thrown out of any place, as I said, was for asking too many questions. And so you can never have perfect information, right? As a seller, you're never going to know everything about your buyers. You're never going to know anything about everything about your product. There's always going to be some things and you're never going to know necessarily how your, your product fits with you know, the needs of the customer. That's what your curiosity is for. And so if you come armed with a script of you know, 10 questions we always ask and then leave it at that, and you don't do or don't ask the real follow-up questions or the right types of questions to elicit the information from the buyer, then you'll never reach that level of understanding. And understanding is the key, right? I write about in the book is, you know, it's much before your job is to understand what's the most important thing to your buyer and then help them get that. Well, you can't help them get it if you haven't understand what it is. And so you have to be persistent. Hey, Mark, I know you're going to, it's hard to believe, but we're coming up to the end of this podcast. So I wanted to have you uh, ask the last question. Any questions you want to give Andy about the book? Well, I, I guess the first question is, Andy, does getting thrown out of a bar count as getting thrown out of any place? That was the first. So <laughs> well, you, uh, you, I just said I wasn't thrown out for asking too many questions, but yes, I've, oh, yeah. <laughs> I've, I've been thrown out of customers' offices. Yes. Uh, <laughs> for different reasons. Well, yeah, that's a whole, that could be a, almost a podcast in itself about uh, how, not to, how not to negotiate. But uh, yeah. Yeah, let, let's close it up on generosity another tenant sure. within your book. So how, in the selling process, how do you leverage generosity? How do you give? How do you give value? Mm -hmm. um, share, share the importance of that as our closing set of points. Sure. Well, go back to that statement I made about you know, what our job is as sellers is to listen to understand what's the most important thing to a buyer, then help them get that. Let's just deconstruct that statement. Yeah, our, our job is to go out and listen and if we're listening, that's, that's an act of generosity. To understand, that's, that's an act of generosity. What's most important to the buyer, again, we're understanding what's most important to that's an act of generosity, and then helping them get it, that also is generous. So just, just the basic nature of what our job is as sellers is in itself an act of generosity and giving. So yeah, the word value you talked about gets... gets it's become one of those cliches, right? In sales, value this, value that, deliver value, create value, so on. And so I try to do in the book is, is really simplify it for sellers and say, look, here's, here's what value is. Value is equal to progress, meaning that if as a result of interacting with you, doesn't matter what form, an email, <laughs> a you know, phone call, a Zoom call, whatever, if in-person meeting, if as a result of interacting with you, the buyer is not closer to making a decision after the interaction than they were before, meaning that they made no progress, then there was no value for them. It's that simple because you've got limited time. The buyer has limited time and attention. What they want from their interaction with sellers is to move closer to making a decision. So think about it. You know, the basic bargain that struck with a buyer is, hey, I'm the buyer. I'm going to give you, the seller, some of my time and attention. I need to earn a return on that investment. And if I don't earn a re return on that investment of my time and attention, I'm going to stop giving you time. It's that simple. I love that simple equation. Giving value equals progress. If you didn't make progress in that sales cycle, et cetera, you probably need to reflect on why didn't I provide more value? Well, you didn't, you, because you weren't intentional about 
the value you needed to provide, right? So as I talk about in the book, is very simple. If you were a, if you're a sales leader listening to this, is you should be able to go down every qualified opportunity in a seller's pipeline and ask them two questions about every opportunity. One, what value does the buyer need from us now to move closer to making a decision? And two, as a result of receiving that value, what steps will they commit to take next? And if your sellers can't answer those two simple questions about every supposedly qualified opportunity in their pipeline, then they haven't been doing a good job. They haven't been (laughs) deploying their curiosity to ask the right questions. They aren't reaching the level of understanding that they need to understand to reach, excuse me, in order to be able to help the buyer because they don't know where the buyer is headed. And so it's, it's really just as an acid test. And so if you as a seller go through your own pipeline, you can't answer those questions for two simple questions for every opportunity. Then you got to go back and you got to <laughs> get some more time from the buyer and ask a better set of questions, go deeper. And I lay out six question types in the book, in the chapter that you can use in solo or in combination to help you reach that level of understanding. And I think there can't be a better way to end the podcast. Those two questions are so tangible and so easy. And I just want to repeat them. Number one, if you're a professional salesperson or sales manager out there, look at your pipeline and ask two questions. Number one, what value does a buyer need from me right now? And if I deliver that value, what's the steps they're going to take, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Love it. So, Mark, we have to end today's podcast. Thank you, Zoe, for being our co-host. Thank you. And you know, I always hand it back to you to, uh, to close us out. Andy, thank you very much. This has been awesome. Mark, thank you. For everybody, Andy Paul is not only the host of the Sales Enablement Podcast, which I highly recommend. I learned so much from every episode, and I truly mean that. And second of all, the book, the title is Sell Without Selling Out, available on Amazon. Correct, Andy? Available on Amazon. You don't mind me a little self, self-promotional plug right there? So no, I know. I, well, there it is. A good producer where we can Amazon that out. independent bookstores, wherever you buy books, uh, it's available. Okay. And to our listening audience, if you're enjoying our podcast, our great guests like Andy Paul and the content that we cover, it would mean the world to Mark and I to go ahead and subscribe to the Selling the Cloud podcast on your favorite podcast app and go ahead and give us that five-star recommendation and rating and tell us how we can even make the podcast better for you and your colleagues. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, guys. Thanks all. Cheers.